explain the, uh, the <coughs> thinking behind the title. Uh, for us, the Zenit of the National Power, that seems to be self-evident. It's the revisited that might strike uh, some of you as being uh, maybe not entirely uh, clear or uh, intuitive. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to uh, juxtapose two different modes or two different issues uh, when talking about the national poet. One is the reception itself, uh, where the central thesis, which I'll say now and then repeat in the course of uh, briefly outlining it, is that national poets are made, not born. Uh, that it's the process of reception that makes national poets. Seems uh, quite simple, but it's counterintuitive, because the whole nature of the discourse of the national poet is totalizing. It is romantic in its nature. Uh, it is uh, adverse to uh, contradictions and aporias. It is monolithic. And the other is the uh, actual work of the poet, which is uh, an essential component in that dialogic to and fro between the work and the reception. And uh, I'll spend more time on the latter than on the former. Um, some time ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, I participated in a conference in Uvesky uh, Radice in uh, the Czech Republic, which was on uh, the topic of national myths and mystifications. And I gave a paper there on national poets and national mystifications. Curious combination, which might strike some of you as also very counterintuitive. Um, but I think if we can develop that maybe in the question and answer period, uh, national mystification and national poets have common ground. They both are a product of uh, reception and of a kind of totalizing um, effect. So, very briefly, um, are national poets a universal phenomenon? Well, yes and no. Very many nations have national poets. But not all of them. There is no consensus on who is the American national poet. Uh, and people might say it's Walt Whitman. Uh, some might say Emily Dickinson. But clearly there is no, no consensus. There is no French consensus on who is the French national poet. André G is supposed to have said, uh, when asked who is the French national poet, he said, Victor Hugo, hélas. So, um, and another quip is that we, the French, don't have national poets. We have national dishes. Uh, uh, the uh, bilingual country, uh, like uh, Canada, would probably not have a national poet by definition because there's a French and, a, and an English component. This, the same applies to uh, Belgium. Uh, but there is a, a tendency, especially in the Slavic countries, to uh, that is, there's a pronounced presence of, of such figures. And they have a sublime role. Uh, they uh, exemplify the national identity. Uh, they are empowering images. Uh, and they are all more or less products, especially in Eastern Europe and the Slavic lands, of uh, uh, basically romantic poetics and of various uh, processes of nation building. Uh, but that is not the case with uh, Dante, the French national poet. Uh, I'm sorry, the Italian men, of course. Um, and uh, the um, English national poet, Shakespeare, uh, was um, uh, a product of a process of national, I should say, strife and crisis rather than national building, although that might be the same thing. Uh, one of the sidelines for this is that national poets may be subsets of national heroes. And therefore, uh, the French don't need or there is no room in French culture for a national hero uh, because in the period when these are made, uh, for in the Napoleonic period, it's Napoleon who occupies that role. Similarly, in the American experience, it is either George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, and uh, the function of uh, Walt Whitman is decidedly secondary to these larger than life figures. Uh, but leaving the uh, anthropological or the cultural writ large aside, in the purely literary note mode, uh, the question may also follow or be a, 
an extension of a very powerful poet of the early 19th century who created the model for the various Slavic <coughs> national poets, and that is Byron. Uh, the Byronic impact uh, is, I think, uh, quite pronounced. It's something that bears separate study. Uh, I will just mention a few moments here. The whole question of political dissent, uh, involvement in the liberation struggle, uh, social criticism or a profound uh, you know, impact on uh, the, 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 the providing a social critique, uh, a sense of creating a personal mystery around himself, and uh, um, uh, and also the projecting uh, a kind of aesthetic subtlety and uh, in, in this case, in Byron's case, a refined, a refined dandyism becomes a, a part of the uh, paradigm. Certainly, this works for Einstein, uh, and for uh, Pushkin. And uh, in various ways, this problem has been treated. Whether this can be made to apply to Shuchenko, yes, I think that despite the apparent differences, um, uh, that, that would obtain. In any case, as far as the at least uh, European or Slavic context, the three figures that are closest to my research and that I focused on in this um, paper some time ago um, were uh, Mitskevich, Pushkin, and Shevchenko. And curiously, they all follow a similar pattern or, or analogous stages of apotheosis of the bard and the martyr and indeed the prophet. They certainly all become massive cult figures and they epitomize uh, the national uh, spirit. With the major distinction that Shuchenko in that group by far is the one who occupies the role of prophet uh, most securely, that is the way of putting it, he, in, in a way that differs even from the very powerful and cultic role that was uh, acceded to uh, both uh, Mitskevich and uh, Pushkin in their societies. Um, he really does become a kind of secular religious leader. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the numinous or the religious dimension of his impact, I think, is, uh, is evident. And this is something that I will refer to uh, shortly. Um, the, uh, some of the mechanisms that uh, apply to the creation of or the making of national poets in these uh, societies, uh, I'm not speaking about it universally, um, is that uh, they all follow a certain thematic pattern. That is to say, Mitskevich uh, uh, and his uh, Pantadeus, uh, Pushkin and his Paris de Dunov, uh, Shuchenko and his Haidemarke, intuitively, seemingly intuitively, uh, with a higher sense of purpose, uh, focus on a historical experience uh, as that which creates a nation's ethos. Um, and through that, they lay claim to speaking for the entire collective, for the nation itself. Um, it's not only through that historical or collective experience, but it's primarily through that. Certainly, uh, um, uh, in Shochenko's major political poem, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the epistle, um, when he says, he is speaking to a transcendent collectivity that uh, uh, transcends time, transcends the living, the dead, whether in Ukraine or not in Ukraine. It, uh, it is an uh, order of, uh, of a great sacred trust and mission. Um, in the other writers, analogous uh, statements are uttered and claims are made. Um, uh, Conrad Weidenberg already in Mitskevich's uh, poem, um, uh, the eponymous hero is laying claim, albeit in a Byronic guise, to speaking for and being a martyr in the nation's cause. Analogously, with specific nuances, because Pushkin's case, each case is obviously nuanced, uh, the role of the individual as a particularly charged by the collective who he is addressing is, um, is re reflected also. Ironically, in, if you remember the, uh, uh, the uh, opera Risto Bunov, it seems that the voice of the poet is expressed through to the role of the Irodevi. You know, wonderful 
touch, you know, that he is the one who senses the tragedy of Russia and the snooper. In any case, Mitskevich puts it very directly when he says, I am the nation, the one I speak for millions. This is what the man is also saying so effectively uh, in, uh, in his, uh, uh, in Ziadi, and uh, also in uh, the books of the Polish uh, nation and the Polish pilgrimage. Uh, the identification of poet and nation is, uh, is very profound. What else, else is important? Because obviously th th this is always a multifaceted uh, process. The fact of taking risks. All of these poets take risks. Most uh, directly, Pushkin, who goes out and has too many duels and dies in one of them. Uh, that is, as it were, making risk-taking part of your life. Uh, but they take risks in formal ways. Uh, it is most evident in the case of Mitskevich, who never repeats himself. He goes from one form to another. There's a cycle of sonnets, there's Jade, there's Pantadeus, there's the books, and never repeats himself. Shuchenko repeats himself many times, but he also is continually taking risks as far as creating form. And the same applies to him. These are all poets who are intuitively uh, very great risk takers, and they convey that risk to the audience. And the audi audience realizes that they're dealing with a poet that is one of a kind. Nobody else does things like these do. Uh, and that immediately establishes a, um, a sense of, uh, of special, of, of, of uniqueness. Um, they all use the, the, the mechanisms of symbolic autobiography. They put themselves into their poetry. And through that, we can reinforce this, uh, this sense of, uh, of, uh, of a remarkable, if you will, connection. Uh, and finally, and this is not to exhaust the, the, the categories or the issues, but simply to, uh, to, to bring them to your attention and to go on, um, is that they intuit that they can speak to the nation, to the collective, only in the discourse that the collective will understand. Now that is a tautology. Uh, that is to say, it is uh, something that uh, it, it is hard to, to break through that circularity. But in, in, while creating new forms, they are also intuiting uh, the, na the nature of the established uh, and, the, and the central values of the established discourse. And they're continually developing. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you can immediately postulate what things would not be appropriate and what, uh, what are. Uh, let us turn now specifically to uh, Shuchenko. Uh, what is peculiar about Shuchenko's reception, because we're still on the reception part of things, um, uh, that I want to, to, uh, to sum up here, is that his, uh, uh, and, and there are parallels between him and Mitskevich and Pushkin here too, is that his, the reception of his first uh, Kozla was remarkable in its, um, uh, in its you know, totality. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, it, it uh, uh, was given to the censor uh, in, uh, uh, whenever it was in, in, in late 1840, I'm sorry, in the beginning of 1840, and uh, 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 Korsakov, the censor, passed it in the sum of zero days. The very same day that the poem came to, the declaration of poetry came to the censor, he signed off on it. Uh, and then they backdated the time when the poem, when this, uh, when the collection was submitted. So it came sometime in March, he backdated it to the 12th of February. And this is how it given. There was, in other words, and this is reflected also in the, uh, uh, early responses, which were very uh, substantial. Um, uh, all the major uh, journals of Petersburg uh, responded to it. You know, Sinatyechus by Mayak and uh, and Zedemayach uh, and Hekadashtenia uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, all, virtually all of them were stressing the fact that Suchenko uh, was a very uh, promising and very powerful poet, even though this is the first, uh, the first collection. It was a presumption of quality in other words. That has a concrete reason. Shuchenko was already known as a student of Grilov, 
and Brilhoff was seen as a painter of genius. And a painter of genius must necessarily have a student of genius. So there was a kind of a presumption of quality from the beginning. Um, the, the, the light motif in these early receptions um, was also why is he writing in a language which some of us don't understand. You know, uh, this is a writer with such talent should be writing in Russian and not in Ukrainian. But the presumption that this is a very powerful poet was there from, from the outset. Um, to jump ahead uh, and to see the impact of his poetry not only on the Russian reviewers, because many of them were not entirely um, uh, attuned to the full range of the texture of poetry, uh, but if we think now how the Ukrainian reception went and how we now read um, uh, the uh, Kobza, uh, I would just want to note three or four moments that set him apart immediately and in a sense totally. One is that this is a poetry that uh, articulated, uh, was seen as articulating the voice of the people. We've heard that already. Uh, but this was specifically rooted in the sense of being clear and simple and natural. As Kostomarov later said, it is the way people would speak, if they could speak the way that Shogunov speaks. Uh, at the same time, curiously, this was a poetry that was in a formal way, highly sophisticated. Uh, it controlled its diction, it used poetic imagery and intertext in various subtle ways, and only a few of the contemporaries actually caught that. They knew that this was very good poetry, but they couldn't see all these moments. And it's only much later that we saw poets, not only Ukrainian poets and critics, uh, uh, tuning into and appreciating uh, Shuchenko's sophistication uh, as, uh, as the years went on. Osip Mandrishtan, an outstanding Russian poet of the early 20th century, a great fan of Shuchenko's, also for this uh, sense of great poetic mastery and sophistication. A poet who, in a way that was absolutely unique and unprecedented, as far at least as Ukrainian poetry is concerned, uh, established the presence of his own individual voice. Uh, his contemporaries didn't do that. They were not confident enough, they didn't have that component to them. Uh, from the very first line of Shuchenko's published poetry, uh, there was a sense of a personal voice, of a presence, of a psyche that is working on the reader. There was a poetry of intense emotions and intense cathexis. You were going through an experience. The poem was not just the text, it was an experience that was lived, and people were uh, very much uh, uh, affected by that. It's a poetry that grew on archetypes. I spoke on that at a separate occasion, so uh, in the end of the so I don't want to belabor it today, but it's a poetry that from the earliest, from that Pechinna, and then from Katerina, and then as time went on even more so, Perebenia, uh, it is drawing on cultural and deep psychological collective archetypes. And even if you didn't know the term then, most people didn't because the term was coined and developed by, by Gustav Jung in the early 20th century, but the phenomenon was always there. And this is what he was making the basic building block of his, of his poetry. It was a poetry uh, which also involved the personal self-injection of the poet into the collective canon and uh, especially the collective, if you will, uh, 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 the, 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 the song, the, the gathering of the, of the writers, that is to say, in, into the, uh, uh, the canon, that is to say, among the, the greats of the literature. Not that there were that many, but he was already projecting himself into it. So two such poems as Nabichnu Pamit Kotlareuskumu, Dos Nodyananka, and Hovoru, this young poet was already saying, I'm on par with them. It was very bold. It was very self-assertive. And anyone who read it could not but see that this is not just a run of the mill poet. This is somebody who is arrogating to himself this uh, potential and this power. As Harold Bloom says, strong poets speak strongly. You know, this is, this is their nature. Uh, 
It is a poet that it, 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 he was and is a poet who projected deep mythical constructs and with that the realm of the sacred. And this is what I want to now uh, develop uh, in the time uh, remaining. Uh, we begin to see how Shuchenko does this complicated task of um, forming both his agenda and forming the reader in the poem Heidemaki, which was already discussed earlier today by uh, uh, Roman Kurovetsky, and which perhaps in our discussion we can also refer back to it, um, where you see any number of these moments already being developed in the poem. So the, the focus on its uh, uh, sophisticated presentation. It's a poem that is narrated by two voices with many digressions, the voice of the, uh, the Kobzar, uh, man of the people, and the voice of the poet. And they don't always say the same thing. In fact, they seem to speak in a kind of strained dialogue. They don't agree on things. Um, there's a sense uh, of having to return to difficult and terrifying events um, and to uh, develop them, but with, with different senses of, of uh, of how to do it. Uh, for the poet, as he says, set the bullet aus kazu treba. For the Kozar, it is a question of righteous uh, uh, comeuppance, of righteous, uh, of God's righteous um, uh, punishment. But uh, the poet sees things differently, um, or in a more nuanced and complex way. It is also um, uh, a poem that uh, draws on Pagonic influence. Uh, but more importantly, it is one who, uh, one, and I've devoted much of that monograph that uh, uh, Roman referred to, um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the introduction of the imposition of the biblical ethos of, of an apocalyptic vision, uh, through which uh, a new sense of identity can be, um, uh, can be established. So it's not so much a historical work, certainly not the historiographic work that so many Ukrainian critics, especially contemporary critics, uh, uh, imply, um, um, but uh, a work that examines also a very contemporary subject, uh, the, top, the topos of memory and of identity, uh, especially of uh, collective identity. And finally, this is, uh, this is all, um, as we heard, um, um, summarized or uh, essentially phrased in the uh, um, in the final uh, part, uh, the penultimate part, in fact, uh, the uh, a symbolic reenactment uh, or a kind of symbolic sacrificial expiation of this whole um, horrific uh, event. Um, Haidemaki introduces and is continued on in Shulchenko's subsequent collection, which I think fully establishes the voice of the national poet, and that is the collection which in the literature, the critical literature, is called the Tredita period. Poetry written between 1843 and 1845, where one after another the works that are uh, written by Shulchenko establish his claim to speaking for the whole collective, for the nation. Um, uh, already in uh, uh, the, the, one of the first of these poems, uh, he is, uh, this is in, uh, uh, I'm jumping ahead because there's an, an intervening Amalia, but in the poem Pohengu in 1844, he's already looking back at, um, at Haidemaki as, uh, as a work that is not related only to the past, but to the present and to, to the uh, dire straits that Ukraine is in. Uh, this is how he um, how he puts it near the end. Ne zarebut Ukraini vojni armate, ne zarije pač posina svoje idetine za čest, slavu za protesto za volju Ukraine, ne zarije. Vekoha je da je prodaz bliznici muskaleri. Cepto bačeš lepta u dovici, prestolovi o večestu da njima ti plata. The um, this apocalyptic sense of, a, of, a, uh, of an issue still to be resolved, uh, of a political state of affairs that needs uh, a kind of uh, resolution is, is directly put here. Similarly, and very soon thereafter in the poem, Kolodny Yad, the Cold Ravine, um, he uh, sees now a kind of a, a, images of a new Haida Machina coming. Uh, 
this is uh, the, over this Kolodny Yad, the, the actual physical ravine where the, like the mice gather, there is the shadow of, of uh, Konta and Zaliznyak. So the Nadiaun Zaliznyak Vitae, the Nahuman Kozerae, Gontu Vitae. This is, if you will, an allusion to another divinely sanctioned uh, 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 punishment, Kara, that will deal with the new oppressors and to which he turns very directly. These are, by the way, statements that are frequently heard in today's discourse. Uh, even before the events of Maidan of February and middle of January, I remember when speaking about Haidemake last year, my colleagues here can confirm this. Uh, people from the audience were saying, but you must also remember that the Haidemachina is something that is alive today. This is not just, I mean, they were in a sense almost anticipating what was going to happen. This was in August, and these events were in December, January, February. Exile very carefully, 
you will see how often he returns to it and how important it is to, as it were, free himself from uh, these, uh, uh, these feelings and in a sense to emerge uh, transformed and healed. And that is how uh, he does. Uh, he emerges in 1857 as if he writes of it, as if he remained unscathed. It's not really so. There was tremendous scars that were left. But the image and the self-sense of the poet is one who has emerged from that darkness, from that shadow. It's very characteristic that in that diary of his, which he kept from, 18, um, from the time that he learned that he would be freed from exile in uh, uh, late April of, of April of 1857 to 1858, uh, he also, for a short while, allowed it to be a scrapbook. So when he was released from from prison, from, from exile, and was in Yuzhny Novgorod, and then went further on, he would allow people to write various things in there. And one of the things that was written was by a, a, a real admirer of him, a Pole, who uh, wrote in it a very short little thing saying, Vienti esciente vieshtru maluske literatura, dedicated to the great holy vieshtru, or poet, national poet of Ukrainian literature. It's remarkable that already his readers were realizing that. Uh, this too is part of the growth and the development of the national poet, and we are beginning to address uh, it in 